Dr. Turner, inviting you to join Angela and Johanna Fernandez and myself as we gather to discuss Mumia and his important new book, Writing on the Wall, Selected Prison Letters. This will happen Thursday, February 18th at 7.30 p.m. at First Congregational Church of Oakland, 2501 Harrison Street. There's free parking and wheelchair access at this KPFA benefit, which is co-sponsored by City Lights Books. Advanced tickets are available at brownpapertickets.com, Marcus Books, and other independent bookshops. Find more information on the KPFA website for February 18th, Gathering for Mumia. Good evening. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF Fresno, or sorry, yes, 88.1 KFCF Fresno, 97.5 K248BR Santa Cruz, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 9.01. Stay tuned for suspense. Tonight, we take pleasure in bringing you Suspense, a weekly anthology of notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in Suspense. Detroit, early 1950s. The erstwhile arsenal of democracy had switched back to a civilian footing. It had also emerged as the nation's fourth largest city, with a total population of nearly two million. Its three major sports teams had won a combined five championships in as many years, and its median income was the highest of any major city in America. Detroit was also renowned for two other very disparate reasons. It was an established music center with a jazz scene that regularly attracted the likes of Duke Ellington and Ella Fitzgerald. It was also the home of the Detroit Partnership, one of the largest branches of the infamous Cosa Nostra, the American Mafia. And when those two worlds met, the results were seldom happy. Evening, Abner. Evening, Madeline. I see all my die-hard fans are in attendance. I hope they haven't been causing too much of a ruckus, clamoring for me to begin. Yeah, you know this bunch. The only thing they've been clamoring for is refunds. Yeah. Hey, don't take it too personal. Clubs here in the theater district live and die by the shows that are playing. And they're a bunch of stinkers right now. It's okay. I know the score. I'm not exactly Rosemary Clooney. You've got a good heart, Abner. Even if it is tough to hear beating over that sailor mouth of yours sometimes. Hey, it's a tough job. Somebody's got to talk to these people in a language they'll understand. I get you, Abner. Have you seen Victor? Yeah. He's here. Table at the far end. Wait. He's not alone. Oh, he brought a friend? You might say that. I don't understand. He's with another girl. Oh. 
they've been all over each other since they got here. I'm sorry, man, but... Look, the guy's a lousy bum. You're better off without him. I'll talk to him. Get your hands off me. You're a scandal. Hello, Victor. Why, Maddie, there you are. We were just talking about you. <laughs> yeah, the sultry singer. How Dolores. Excuse me? I mean, would you look at that dress? Oh, now, Dolores, don't be like that. Oh, but don't be like that. Just get a load of that old black get-up. Sheesh, where's the funeral? Look, you, I don't know what your problem is, but... Okay, okay. <laughs> Put the claws away, ladies. <laughs> Victor, what is going on? Why, nothing at all, Maddie. What makes you think there is? Well... Victor, who is she? Who's who? Your friend. Oh, you mean my cousin, Dolores. Cousin? My cousin, Dolores. She's in Detroit for a visit, so I'm showing her the sights. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> cousin Victor's a real swell guy. He's been showing me all the best places. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing but the best from my cousin. <laughs> hey, Maddie, why don't you join us for a drink? Dolores and I are just talking over family affairs. <laughs> <laughs> we have a very close family after all. I have to start my set. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, it was all just a misunderstanding. She's Victor's cousin. She's just visiting. Cousin? Yes, his cousin. And you believe that? Of course I do. Victor wouldn't lie to me. Will you listen to yourself? He's lying through his teeth, and you're just going to let him go ahead and do it without even letting out a peep? Abner, please. Abner, please nothing. Wake up and smell the coffee, Madeline. He's a two-bit hood who's probably been alley-catting on you all along. Only now he's not even doing it on the sly. I don't get it, Madeline. A woman like you, you can have any fella you want. Any fella, except a true one. Sorry, the dramatics must be a byproduct of my proper southern upbringing. Why, Madeline? Why do you let Basil treat you like dirt? Because he said he loved me. And maybe because it's easier to live with a lie than it is to live with the truth. Madeline, I... I should start my set.
So, big boy, you want to show a girl a good time? No can do. What about you, handsome? Gotta watch the bar. Oh, gee whiz, what's a girl got to do to make an honest buck around here? What would I know about making an honest buck? I'm a jazz singer. You seem to have gotten yourself out of the dumps, but good, Miss Charles. Why, Abner, I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. Of course you don't. What I mean is, you're in much better spirits now than you were just 24 hours ago. Oh, you know what changeable creatures we women are. Believe me, I know. I was married for 10 years. Changeable is one thing. But you sure look like a woman who went from the depths of depression to the peaks of ecstasy overnight. So what gives? Mm, I don't know. Perhaps it's the change in the weather? Weather my eye. Come on. I mean, if you can't tell your favorite barkeep, who can you tell? I suppose you're right. Does it have to do with Basso? Maybe. Did you finally tell him to take a hike? Mm, not exactly. If not that, then what gives? Well, I'm not supposed to tell anyone. Madeline? Okay, I'll tell you. But someday's a little more private. Okay, I'll go out there. Frankie, you're in charge. Frankie in charge? If I left no one in charge, they both help themselves. This way, only one of them booze hounds is behind the bar pilfering. Makes sense. I guess that's why you're the boss and I'm the hired help, right? <laughs> right. So what's going on? Victor said I wasn't to tell a soul about this, but... Oh, I just have to tell someone before I explode. You're the best friend I have in the world, Abner, and I know I can trust you with anything. Damn right you can. So what's the big secret? Victor asked me to marry him. He what? He asked me to marry him. In fact, we're eloping tonight. Madeline, doesn't this seem kind of sudden? I mean, he was two-timing you with some young floozy just the other night. And now he wants to get hitched? I know, I know it. It all sounds very spur of the moment. But Victor and I have been seeing each other for almost a year now. So it shouldn't come as that big a surprise, should it? So what caused Basil's change of heart? I don't know. Uh, last night I decided to go over to Victor's place. I, I needed to talk with him. Well, when I got there... Victor was with some men and he was doing business. Business? You mean Basil's kind of business? I'm not really sure. I overheard them discussing a freighter coming into River Rouge tomorrow night. Sounded very important. Why? What did they say about it? Not much. They stopped talking about it as soon as they realized I was there. They did? What happened next? Abner, I don't understand what this has to do with Victor and I. Humor me, will you? What happened next? Well, at first, they were really sore at me. Victor, most of all. I'd never seen him like that before. Then he calmed down. He took me aside and apologized, and that's when he asked me to elope. Madeline, listen to me. I think you overheard something you shouldn't have overheard last night. What? I barely know a thing about that shipment, and even if I did, I'd never tell a soul. What you actually know doesn't matter. Only what they think you might know. If you go with Basso tonight, you might not be coming back. Madeline, all signs point towards it. You overheard something Basso doesn't want to get out. And you overheard it in front of a bunch of other mobsters. 
so he can't just pretend it didn't happen. He's already got himself a new squeeze, and he's probably thinking about putting you out to pasture anyway. So he figures, why not kill two birds with one stone? And he cooks up this phony elopement. Abner. Only an elopement isn't what he's got planned for you. Abner. He'll kill you, Madeline. Don't you get it? If you go with Thasso, he'll kill you. You're a good friend, Abner. And I know you're just trying to look out for me. But I won't believe this. I can't believe it. And, and even if I did overhear something important last night, Victor's not like that. You just don't know him like I do. You're right. I don't know him like you do. I know him for what he is. You know him for what you want him to be. I'm sorry you feel that way. But you'll see. When I come back in a few days with a ring on my finger, well, you'll see. Any word? Ow! You big dumb mook! Don't you know Abner's all broken up about Madeline leaving last week? For, for all he knows, she could be dead in a ditch somewhere, with crows pecking out her eyes. And here you are, bringing her name up. Insensitive jerk! But I didn't even... Insensitive jerk! Ow! Ugh! Nothing? No. Yeah. Madeline? Madeline? Is that really you under that veil? It's me, Abner. It's... It's so good to have you back. It's good to be back. I've missed this place. I've missed you, Abner. I missed you, too. I mean, we all did. Even my diehard fans. Even your diehard fans. So what happened? You're right, Abner. About Victor, I mean. He was no good. He always was. I just didn't want to see it. Victor picked me up that night. Only he wasn't taking me to Chicago like he said. He was taking me for a ride over to the west side. But things didn't go quite the way he planned. The West Side? What the hell was he thinking? Boss Fonderus wouldn't sit still for Basso being on his turf, much less whacking someone there. Sorry. Given the veil, I'm guessing his luck ran out. It did. Listen, do you feel up to coming back to work? I was hoping you'd ask that. You haven't hired someone else already? Someone else? <laughs> you must be kidding. What other singer do you know that could keep these jokers in line? And on time. You got that right. When can I start? Whenever you feel up to it. But don't wait too long. I don't think I could stand another jazz arrangement of Mary Had a Little Lamb. <laughs> no time like the present, then.
Thank you so much. We're going to take five and come back with our second set. Come on, Abner, what gives? Yeah, come on, Abner, what gives? I don't know what you two rummies are talking about. Oh, don't give me that. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, don't give me that. You know what I'm talking about. That veil. That morning veil. She's been wearing it for at least a week now. Yeah, at least a week now. And it's really spooky. Yeah, and it's really spooky. Ow! What was that for? You insensitive jerk! Someone dear to Madeline passed away, and you're here calling her spooky. I'm not calling her spooky. I said the veil's spooky. I mean, we don't even know who it's for. Well, huh. Yeah, that's true. Who's it for? Not sure. But I figured it was for Basso, that creep mobster boyfriend of hers. Well... I think Abner's right. It's for that creep mobster boyfriend of hers. I don't. You sound pretty sure of that, Frankie. Yeah. Yeah, how can you be so sure? Because he just walked into the club. Okay, so Madeline's not wearing it for the creep. Then who? Excuse me. Madeline, Basso just walked in. I know. I've been waiting for him to come back. But I thought he was dead. No. Not yet. Then what? Abner, it's better that you don't know anymore. Will you do me one last favor? Anything. You know that. Please leave the club just for a few minutes. What? No way I'm leaving you alone with that bastard. You have to. I don't want you to see what's going to happen. Please, Abner. doing here? You said she left town. It can't be. It's me, Victor. What in the world's going on? No. No. You can't be real. Oh, I'm real, Victor. No. You told me you loved me. No. And you promised to marry me. No. You killed me. No. And now it's time for you to see what's behind my veil. So ends Madeline's Veil by John C. Alzadek and Dana Perry Hayes. Tonight's story of Suspense. Suspense is produced by Blue Hours Productions. Tonight's radio drama was adapted for radio by John C. Alzadek and Dana Perry Hayes from their original story. Dana Perry Hayes was Madeline Charles. Rocky Serta was Abner. Damon Crawl was Victor Basso. Elizabeth Grayson was Dolores. Adrian Wilkinson was Tallulah, and Steve Moulton was Frankie. I'm Damon Crawl. Next week at this time, tune in again for another study in Suspense. I'm John C. Alcedek. And I'm Dana Perry Hayes. Together, we're Blue Hours Productions, the producers of Suspense. In this series of post-episode segments, we'll explain some of the inner workings of radio's outstanding theater of thrills. So please join us as we go Behind Suspense. In this week's segment, we'll talk about suspense. No, not our revival, 
the original suspense, the greatest anthology series ever broadcast on the airwaves. In the early 1940s, dramatic programs concerning murder and the macabre were all the rage, with the likes of Lights Out, The Whistler, The Mysterious Traveler, and Inner Sanctum Mysteries drawing large audiences. But in 1942, CBS Radio premiered the program that was to become the gold standard for shows of this type, Suspense. Its story actually began during the summer of 1940, when a dry run of sorts ran on the summer series Forecast, an adaptation of The Lodger, starring Edmund Gwen and Herbert Marshall, and directed by none other than Alfred Hitchcock. This pilot episode was to set the tone for the series, which stood head and shoulders above its rivals in large part due to the sheer star power. Orson Welles and Agnes Moorhead starred in two of the earliest episodes, Lucille Fletcher's The Hitchhiker and Sorry, Wrong Number. And it wasn't long before Hollywood's elite performers were lining up to appear on Suspense. Over the next decade, the show would feature the likes of Humphrey Bogart, Marlena Dietrich, Judy Garland, Gene Kelly, Jimmy Stewart, and dozens of others, including horror legends Boris Karloff, Bella Lugosi, and Vincent Price. It also provided an unusual opportunity for radio stars, better known as comedic actors, such as Jack Benny and Lucille Ball, to try their hand at darker fare. Combined with sophisticated stories by the likes of Dashiell Hammett, Agatha Christie, and frequent contributor John Dixon Carr, and the atmospheric music of Oscar winner Bernard Herrmann, suspense was a cut above in every way. Unfortunately, the advent of television spelled doom for suspense, and though it outlasted most of its peers by ten years or more, suspense finally went off the air in 1962 an event that is commonly considered the end of radio's golden age. Radio anthologies made a brief comeback in the 1970s via Rod Serling's Zero Hour and the fondly remembered CBS Radio Mystery Theater. But even those fine programs were only a shadow of what suspense had once been. Thank you for joining us on Behind Suspense. Until next time... This is Blue Hours Productions wishing you good night and pleasant dreams. KPFA is looking for volunteers for our winter fun drive starting Tuesday, February 16th to Friday, March 4th. Our phone room is open on weekdays from 6.30 a.m. through 8 p.m. Saturdays, the phone room is open from 7 a.m. until 6 p.m. And Sundays, the phone room is open from 7 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. On Saturday, February 20th, David Gans puts on his annual Grateful Dead Marathon. Join the fun in the phone room until 1 a.m. Deadheads and friends, please come down to KPFA. We are in Berkeley.